All right. Um, good morning. Uh, last session. Uh, let's get started. Uh, before we do, are there any questions on anything from last week? Okay, then uh, I'll remind you that we uh, excuse me, we were starting to analyze the uh, flight data set. Now go through the slides we covered very quickly. Um, so this is the data set of all the flights in New York City from the year 2013. And these are flights that left New York City airports. And um, yeah, so one important point, <laughs> this is not a CAN presentation, uh, which is to say this is a real data set and we're just going to see what we can do. The main point I really want to give you is the kind of tricks you can bring to analysis given the techniques we've learned, in particular using dplyr uh, to create new variables, mutate variables, and ggplot to graph, and seeing how we can use these. This is, after all, uh, class and exploratory data analysis, and these are powerful tools for exploring, and I want to show you a bunch of things you can do to explore. Okay, and the vague goal We'll see if we can predict if a flight will arrive on time. We'll see. So just to remind you what's in the data set, you have the year, which is always 2013, the month, which goes from 1 to 12, days from 1 to 31, the departure time, which goes from 1 to 2400, which tells you that the departure time is the time of day expressed in minutes. Uh, the scheduled departure time will also be expressed in minutes. The departure delay, <coughs> is how long it took, how much later than it was supposed to go. And, and you have a few, evidently one that left 45 minutes early. I feel sorry for the people who thought they was going to leave on time and were there on time. And a max of 1,300, which is, you divide by 60, is over 12 hours late. That was an unpleasant flight. And then you have the arrival time, the scheduled arrival time, and the difference between when it arrived and when it was scheduled to arrive is the arrival delay, and we can see that the smallest uh, arrival delay was it got there a little over an hour early. Um, on average, it was, um, okay, so I'm asked the question, uh, is it a minutes or just 24-hour representation? So the arrival time, it's, it's pretty clear, you know, you, you could read, of course, the data set has documentation, but if you look at the departure time, the fact that it runs between 1 and 2400, tells you that it's the, the time on the day. So in other words, if you really wanted to know what time did it leave, you would combine the year, the month, the day, and then the time of day. So departure time is departure time of the day. It it's, runs between 1 and 2400. All the numbers related to um, departure and arrival are just per day. Um, all right. Does that answer that question, I hope? Okay, great. Um, so we have uh, the schedule, the arrival delay, and we can see this again. This flight arrived over 12 hours late. So we, so looking at this, one thing you can see is usually things aren't so bad. The third quartile is 14 minutes, which means 75. Remember, the third quartile is uh, quartiles divide the data into four pieces, you know, the lowest quarter, the middle quarter, the third quarter, and the final quarter. So the third quartile is a number that uh, three quarters of the data is that number or less. So three quarters of the time the flights were 14 minutes or less uh, arrival delay, which, you know, in the greater scheme of things isn't so bad. But look at the maximum, over uh, 1,200 uh, minutes uh, late. So, uh, 20 hours. Uh, so you can see there's a significant, a, some slides that are significantly delayed. Much more on that later. And A's, so this is the first time we see we don't have information. Uh, we're probably going to have to deal with that. Carrier is just the name of the airline. Uh, the flight is um, flight number, tail number is the tail number of the airplane. Uh, we won't use that. The origin is what airport it came from. Dest is destination, what airport it went to. And then it was how long it was in the air. And the distance is how long was the trip. Uh, 
So the hour and the minute just give you a complete date time stamp. All right. So the first question is, I mean, we're just, let's pretend you really were looking at this. What might you want to ask is, well, one thing is, is let's say you really had to book flights, a lot of flights, like you were in charge of telling your uh, company when, where, what airport they should use and, you know, what time should they use, et cetera, et cetera. What was the best way to ensure that people got to their place on time? So remember, unique gives you the unique values. Flight.origin is the airports, and we see it has three values, EWR, LGA, and JFK. That's the codes for Newark, LaGuardia, and JFK. So there's three airports we're dealing with. Um, and we're going to be calculating a lot of means. And as you saw, there were some NAs, so I'm going to have to use mean of something, na.remove equals true. So I just wrote this function mn, which gave you the mean. And I'll just remind you that putting this line in says that that's the value of the report. But then again, putting this thing y means that if I ask for the mean of a function, it will actually print it out without prompting as opposed to if I didn't have this last line, it would calculate it, but excuse me, but you would have to uh, create a value, say the mean of something is foo, foo, we can get foo. Anyway, uh, we talked about this last time and we went this quiz. So uh, it said it looks like um, Newark is the worst and JFK is the best. Um, from over here. Uh, I'm, I, you know, I mean, obviously, if a plane leaves late, it's not good, but if it arrives on time, you know, you, you kind of don't feel bad about it. So we can see that um, <clears throat> there's a few differences, and we, uh, JFK has a slightly better than LaGuardia arrival delay, and also has longer flights. Um, LaGuardia seems to be more short flights. Incidentally, 800 miles is about the distance from New York to Chicago. Okay. Um, so you could say that and call it an end of the day and we're done, but we're going to try and do some statistics. So one idea is, is we spent a lot of time talking about linear models, and one of the big outputs you saw was not just you got this set of equations or this equation that predicted the value of the output, but you got some evidence, uh, this, these uh, p-values, that told you whether a variable was significant. So we could create a linear model you know, to um, track departures, arrival delay, as a function of airport. The airport is a categorical variable, and we could do that. And so that's one thing we could do. Now, a quick reminder, with categorical variables, LM function and R handles it for us. But in this case, it has um, three values, the three airports. So it's only going to create two variables, right? That's because the third variable is if, if, the, if it's not LaGuardia and it's not JFK, it's Newark. Okay. So what does the linear model show? So we, here's the linear model function. Um, I say I want to compute arrival delay as a function of uh, origin. Origin is the three airports, and my data is the delay data set, which is this. So this will, you know, we want to do a linear model and see if it says the variables are significant. And what do we get? We get nothing very interesting. It just says everything is NA. And then you read and it says NA on zero degrees of freedom, uh, NA on two, zero, and, and what's going on? The answer is there's no residuals. We had three equations and three unknowns. It had an exact solution. So you can do it. It, it just isn't going to give you any idea whether it's statistically interesting or not. OK. so. The first thing that's clear is, or one thing that seems reasonable is to predict the exact time of delay is going to be tough. It's just probably, it is too much for the methods we have. So let's make a simplification. Let's say a flight's on time if the delay is 10 minutes or less. You know, bus to land at 4 o'clock, you get there at 4.02, you don't really care. And it looks like somebody was trying to ask me a question. I'm trying to see the chat. I don't see it. If someone wants to ask a question, uh, just drop it. So we're going to create a new categorical variable that's going to be value like OK or 0 if the delay is less than 10 minutes, and 1 or it's late if the value of the, if the arrival delay is more than 10 minutes. Now, why 10 minutes? 
no good statistical reason, but you know, somewhere around 10, 15 minutes is a break even at which point you start saying, this plane is light, I'm annoyed. So if, if you were analyzing this data set for real, based on what you were doing, you might uh, change this. Another thing you might say, and this would be nothing I did, but you know, just chatting, is you could say, well, I, I you know, if, if, a, if a flight's supposed to be an hour and it's 10 minutes late, that's no good. If it's supposed to be five hours and it's 10 minutes late, it's five minutes and 10 minutes, five hours and 10 minutes, that's fine. You, you might make um, a variable where you call it a plane late, it was more than a certain percentage late, you know, so more, say more than 10% late. But we won't do that. But I'm just pointing out some of the things you could do. So I use this if else function to do that. And uh, this is a simple thing. And, and this works essentially the same way an if else clause works in a, in a computer program. If you have some property, you do something else, you do something else. So if else, flight departure delay is less than 10, 0, 1. What this means is unwrapping the syntax means if the flight departure is less than 10, we give it a value 0. Else we give flight departure delay, we give it the value 1. And I've created this new variable, flight uh, dollar sign on time dot departure. And similarly for arrival, flight dollar on time dot arrival is if else, if the flight arrival delay is less than 10 minutes, we call it a 0. It arrived on time. If it's greater than 10 minutes, we uh, give it a 1 and arrived late. All right, and now we can redo delays by using this information. So we have, we're going to group uh, by this. Remember, this is a very powerful thing. This is, it's essentially the same syntax as SQL. If you understand group by, you understand the most complicated thing in SQL. And when people say, do you know SQL? You can say, yeah, I do. And then you really can't fake it. So we're going to group by the flights by origin. So we're, we're going to compress all the rows we had, the 300, the 3 million rows or whatever it was. Um, down to three by which airport they came from, origin. And now for each one of those rows, which each airport, we're going to give summarize the data. We're going to have the de departure delay, which is the mean of the departure delay. So it's going to tell us how much on average per airport a flight was late, arrival delay, the number of flights in the airport. And this is this very wonderful function that counts the N. So this will just tell you how many rows you can press per new line. The departure delay count is the sum of on-time departure. Um, remember, that's one if you if you arrive if departed late and zero otherwise. So every time there's a one, it's a flight that uh, departed late. And similarly, arrival dot delay count is the sum of the on-time dot arrival. So that's going to count give you a one for every time a flight arrived late. And so now we see we have three lines, one for each airport. We have the average departure delay per airport, the arrival delay per airport. Now, we also have the number of flights, which notice LaGuardia is significantly less, and we have how many flights left le late and how many flights arrived late. Now, this is the um, E or T aspect of ETL. It's explore or transform. But the reality is, if you're not doing a homework exercise where everything is laid out for you on a plate, if you are given a real data set, these are the kind of things you're going to have to do. You're going to have to look at what information you have and what information you can derive from it that's going to allow you to perform tricks. Um, it's a well-known fact, and I mean, I mean, talk to anybody. Typically, 90% of a statistical project is putting the data into a form you can use. There are tremendously powerful statistical tools, of which linear models is one, but just one. But once you have data in the form, you can use it. Applying these tools is generally one or two lines of code. All the deep thought typically goes into how, what variables you create, what variables you eliminate, deciding what is the actual problem you're going to answer, et cetera, et cetera. And as someone else said, um, good variable selection trumps good model selection. So this kind of information is, is kind of getting to the heart of what you really want to do in practice. Anyway, so we, here's the thing. We've summarized it by airport. That's that. So, uh, as I said, LaGuardia has less flights, so it makes a direct comparison hard. So, instead of looking at the number of flights, maybe we should look at the percentage of flights. Now, remember, there's two functions uh, in the dplyr package mutate and transmute. Mutate will add a new variable, transmute 
will um, take your variable, create a new one from it, and get rid of the original one. And for now, let's use transmute because for now we're saying we just want the percentages, and it'll make it simpler. So I say delay dot percentage equals transmute delay, and then I say the arrival dot delay percentage is arrival delay count over the number of flights. Well, that's the percentage. This is how many flights arrive late. This is how many total flights, and similarly for departure delay. And then I um, call it a data frame because it makes doing things like giving row names easier. And then I just want to tell you by row what airport it is. And then I also um, only do it to two decimal places to make this a formatting thing. So when I do this, I've created a new data frame, delay dot percent, and here it is my three airports. And we see that uh, LaGuardia actually had the lowest arrival delay and also significantly the lowest departure delay. But we are statisticians. And we want to test if these differences are significant or not. So we want to have some idea, is, are, are, is it just random noise? If you looked at 2014, these numbers were uh, likely to be similar. If you looked at half a year, you know, we want to see, does this, you know, statistically mean something? I mean, after all, you flip a fair coin 100 times and you get 5149. That's not evidence that the coin isn't a fair coin. So we want to do the Fisher's test. Remember, when you have two by two tables, Fisher's test is best. So just to give you an example, let's check if LaGuardia and, and uh, Newark, the best and the worst, have the same departure and arrival delays. So um, the question we're asking is, is there statistical evidence that the, the percentage of flights that are delayed in Newark is the same as for LaGuardia? So you're asking, is it likely that you've drawn that these two samples you've drawn the 2013 year are likely to have drawn from you know samples with the same distribution? So in other words, do LaGuardia and EWR have the same probability of that flight being delayed? Um, we're looking for statistical evidence. So I, I have to do some more manipulation. So I want to make EWR dot arrivals a matrix. Uh, well, I'm just going to instantiate it by giving it zeros. It's going to have two rows and one column. And we know that, uh, the, well, what, are, what values I want to put in, the uh, late, arrival late, and arrival on time, and the same thing for LaGuardia. And then I'm going to put them together. That'll give my two by two matrix. One column will be LaGuardia, and one column will be, uh, one co excuse me, one column will be Newark, one column will be LaGuardia, and we want to see if, 0.3 to 0.7 is the same as 0.27 to 0.73. So um, we apply the Fisher's test. It is a p-value one. So it, with probability one, the, these two um, distributions, 0.3 to 0.7 and 0.27 to 0.73, come from uh, the same distribution. So according to Fisher's test, they are the same. There's, there's no difference between leaving a, a, going to LaGuardia or going to Newark in terms of whether you're going to arrive late or not, uh, which doesn't uh, seem so plausible, but let's go on. I did the same thing with departures, and I got the same answer. So uh, according to this Fisher's test, there's no statistical evidence that uh, LaGuardia uh, has a different arrival or departure uh, percent probability than uh, Newark. However, I'm not personally convinced. Uh, you may remember that when we were doing chi-square testing, I gave you the example of where I drew from two samples uh, that I were, by definition, I gave, they had different, you know, probabilities of getting heads and tails, and the chi-square test didn't distinguish them, and what really was happening was it didn't have enough data, and when I made the sample size larger, it was very much able to distinguish them. So the same thing is true here. So let's redo the tests. And instead of looking at percentages, which are useful for us to get a, 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 a you know a ballpark idea, let's use the actual numbers. So I'm going to just redo the things, but instead of putting in the percentage of arrival late, I'm going to put in the actual counts. So I'm going to create EWR Newark, I mean EWR arrival, LJA dot arrival, and I'm just going to put in how many flights for each airline. Uh, so um, how many flights uh, for each one? You know, this is uh, late, and this is on time. This is LaGuardia, and this is, this is Newark. So I'm just going to see, is, is, you know, and now I can apply the Fisher's test. 
is it likely that if I drew this many, the sum of these two uh, rows, things, and I got 36,000 delays, is that likely to be drawn from the same population as when we're, if I drew this many, you know, the 104,000, and I got 28,000. So I just do the Fisher test. And now look what happens. Um, now we get a p-value of essentially zero. So uh, the Fisher test is saying there's essentially zero probability that these two ratios are the same. And it's because of the size. And it says that the wealth gives you the odds ratio of 1.16. So we've now found statistical evidence to support the hypothesis that you're better off leaving uh, from LaGuardia if you want to arrive on time than if you leave from Newark. Um, quick question. So I say I want to fly out of LaGuardia, not Newark. When might this information be irrelevant? It's just a little think about it. It's kind of a trick question. When might you not care whether the arrival, uh, whether you leave from LaGuardia, it's not, uh, you're going to be more likely to leave on time. For me, the answer is there's one answer that sticks out. What if the airport you're going to doesn't, you can't get there from LaGuardia? So, you, you, you know, you, it might be interesting to just restrict themselves to, um, if you were to do further analysis, to restrict yourself to just um, airports, destinations that are common to LaGuardia and uh, Newark. But I didn't. That's something you can look at. So the point is, is we did get a different answer, and, and intuitively, while the percentage differences may not be great, we had such a large sample size, 100, 120,000 worth of samples, that any difference was likely to be real. And, and the example I give here is, if some guy says, I'm a stock picker, and he, he says, you take these three stocks, they're all going up, and he's right on two of them, you say, big deal. You know, you could easily, you know, just get lucky. There's a, you know, it's 50-50, so it's not like a sure thing, but, you know, you get lucky. It's the old, um, you know, race tout thing. He goes up to you says, look, I, I'm a great tout. You know, the, you know, bet on Seabiscuit in the third. And, and, and if he loses, you don't owe me anything. If he wins, you give me 10% of what you want. And what has he got to lose? Because some of the time Seabiscuit's going to lose. It doesn't matter to him. But if sometimes the Seabisk is going to win sometimes. And when he wins, he gets paid. So if a guy picks two out of three, you're not necessarily impressed. But if you told a guy, he said, I, I made three million stock picks, and two million of them have been winners, and he can prove that to you, you might think this guy is better than average. He can correctly pick, you know, his ratio is two-thirds. And uh, if you can do that, you're going to really be a winner. So more formally, if you increase the sample size, it makes a 95% confidence interval much more precise. You really get, you know, it's not just what you're 95% confident, you know, it's still the same, but what the, the variance from the mean value gets smaller. As the sample size gets larger, you get much more sure what the real value is. So the 95% confidence interval shrinks. So smaller differences on larger sample sizes are significant. And then I just redid the same thing here for departure. And I got the same um, information that there's a statistical difference. So you can now say with statistical assurance that if you if you can leave from LaGuardia, you prefer that over uh, Newark. Where am I? Here I am. Okay, so another question. Uh, I have a friend who I think has ruined his life because he says. Um, the first flight out is always the, 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 the best flight to be on. It's the least likely to uh, be late. And he thinks nothing of getting up 3, 4 in the morning. I mean, literally 3, 4 in the morning to make sure. I, I see there's a question. Give me a second. Uh, to see if there's, um, to make sure he's there. So he, he's in whatever city he's going to, he's there by typically 7, 8 o'clock. And then he always complains about being tired. Okay. So I, we had a question. So I'm asked, is it advisable to use actual data number than to summarize them into percentages for doing statistical tests to get accurate results? So the moral of the story is, so the answer to that question is yes. If you use the actual data, right, you can take into account sample size. Sample size is really important. The larger the sample size, the better the estimates you're going to get. 
If you just, now why, so you say, well then why take percentages at all? It's because human beings don't understand, I don't know, well, I shouldn't say human beings, I should say, for example, many people I've talked to, myself included, have a hard time comparing very large numbers. And when you take percentages, it became immediately clear to me that LaGuardia was, uh, you know, had much better numbers than uh, Newark. So if, for example, you were looking, if you had, say, 20 airports and you were staring at 20 numbers like, you know, 20 pairs of numbers like this, it might be really daunting if you were to rank them. But if you compute percentages, you would then really, you would really be able to easily see the rankings. However, if you want to do statistical testing, because sample size matters, you would then use the actual numbers. Okay? Uh, does that answer the question? I'll let the gentleman... Um, Ask more if he wants to. Is that okay? We good? Yeah, so and as he says, right, based on percentage, we didn't see that LaGuardia was really better when you plugged in the actual numbers because it was such a large sample size, it became readily apparent that the difference between 20, you know, if, if I give you 10 samples and, you know, one of them is 27% accurate and the other is 30% accurate, you might just say, who knows? I mean, that's just rounding error in a sample size of 10, but a sample size of 100,000 plus, it's not. Okay, so as I said, you know, does departure delay depend on the time of day? That's a very reasonable question to ask, and let's take a look at it. And let's, I'm going to write the code in a way so that it's possible to reuse it. This is always a good idea. Um, this is really more about R and coding. But the more general you can make your code, the better it is, the easier it is to reuse it. So let's create variables for the time of day. So as you know, the, the theory is the first flight out or early morning flights are more likely to be on time than later in the day. Now we could, you know, again, as a practical matter, to just sort of say each minute is its own niche and create uh, 2,400 different times a day is way overboard. So just for the sake of simple analysis, something reasonable to do as a first shot, let's just create three times a day, sort of morning, midday, and evening, and we can use if-else to do that. So this is a nice example of if-else. It shows you how powerful it can be. And um, the first thing I did is I did a histogram to kind of show, to, so what is this? This is um, the flights per hour based on the hour of the day. So we see before 5 in the morning, there's essentially no flights. Uh, 20 is 8 o'clock. At 8 o'clock, they start coming down. At 10 o'clock, there's very little flights. So it's going to be reasonable to look at time of day and just say before 8 or so and sort of put it here as one thing, here is another thing, and use that. So we're going to call So if I lose before 8 in the morning, we're going to call it early. If we lose before 8 at night, but not before 8. We're going to call it midday, and we're going to call the rest evening. So I'm going to create a variable TOD for time of day, and I'm just going to use the if-else. So I'm going to say if-else, if the flight hour, so in other words, the hour left is before 8, we're going to call it early. Now, how do I deal with the fact that the balance I want to do? I just say, well, what do I do with the balance? I use another if-else clause. So I use if-else, flight hour less than 16 midday, and then evening. So this first, it's out of if-else, says flights less than 8, we call it early. Everything else, what do we call it? Well, I, it depends because I have a, a second if-else clause, right? So you use a second if-else clause to divide it. Now it's going to divide it if it's between 8 or before 8, it's going to call it early. If it's between 8 and 16, it's going to call it midday. And now if it's greater than 16, it's going to call it evening. Um, so we can do this. We're going to use um, how TO day works, uh, we're going to use the group by and summarize because we just group by time of day. Now, if you start looking at codes online, you're going to see a lot of uh, people using pipes for this because you're doing something and iterating and creating new things. First, I'm going to create it, I'm going to summarize it, then I'm going to do something else. And he likes pipes, I don't. Um, so if, if you like pipes, feel free. But for me, what I do is I just put everything on different lines. I find it much easier to write than using pipes. So I, I, I create, I say flights is my FLTS flights is my flights data set. I'm just creating a duplicate copy because now I can put this FLTS flights in here. And what this means is if, if I want to change 
which flights I wanted. For example, if I wanted to look at just flights from LaGuardia, if I wanted to look at just flights that arrive in Houston, I could, you know, create a new set and say flights equals that. I won't have to change everything because my flights data set is a data set I don't want going away. So I'm going to group by flights by the time of day. So that's going to create a data set with three lines, early, midday, and evening. Now, what information am I going to get? Okay, um, I want to get how many flights were in that time of day, the departure delay, and the arrival delay for that time of day. And you see, I'm using this MN function, which just is saying I'm getting rid of the NAs and computing the mean. And so I do this, and I get a count. You see, I have three rows, early, evening, and midday, and how many flights. So interestingly, there are less flights in the morning. And then we see the... Uh, the departure delay and the arrival delay. And I mean, it's over, you know, we, from our experience with the um, airports, you know, these, these are big sizes. It's clear this is going to be statistically different. It's clear that if you leave in the evening, those are your mites that are going to be most likely to be delayed. And why? Because any del delays tend to accumulate. If there's a delay earlier in the day someplace else, it just tends to echo throughout the rest of the day. So that seems to be true, um, but as I said, you know, oh, so this is just iterating that point I made before. You could you could just redo it if you just wanted to do it for LaGuardia. You could do it that way if you wanted to do it for a destination. It turns out IAH, IAH is um, Bush Airport in Houston, so I, IAH is um, Houston. Um, many of these airport codes are bizarre because they have to do with um, um, earlier incarnations of what the airport is. For example, you may wonder, the big airport in Chicago is called O'Hare, and its um, symbol is ORD, and you say, how do you get ORD from O'Hare? Well, the, the answer is, uh, before O'Hare was a major airport, it was a very minor local airport called Old Orchard, ORD Orchard. So, but anyway, this is it. So you, you could do these kind of filters, and you could just put them in the code from the previous line. You can said you could do flights.lga and you can get the information for just LaGuardia, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, by doing it this way, you can do that. All right, first quiz. How would I get flights flying from LaGuardia to IAH? Okay, so th this is a, a good um, typical example of the use of deep wire. I, I want to I want to just say I'm only interested in flights that go, hey, we got customers in Houston. We want to leave from LaGuardia because we, we got, you know, we have a good deal with an airplane that only leaves there. Um, and we're flying into there. What time of day should we do it? So how would you get the flights? And notice I misspelled flights. Flights that um, go from LaGuardia to IAH. So there's four choices. Uh, filter. So flights, comma, origin equals LGA, and logical and filter, flights, comma, destination equals IAH, or intersect the two, filter, so the filter to get the flights that go through LaGuardia, and filter to get the flights that um, uh, land in IAH, and just take the intersect. Three, filter flights, make the origin equal LGA and the destination equals IAH, and four, filter flights, and notice the square brackets, which says I'm indexing in flights, origin equals LGA, and destination equals that. So filter uh, flights by using logical indexing in there. So those are the four choices. Okay, I have one for one and one for three. Let me just give you one hint. Uh, it's it's not four. Uh, you, you might be you could possibly make logical indexing work, but um, typically you would just have to have column, and then and then you wouldn't have this equal, which because this means you're assigning origin to this. You'd have to have the uh, double equal sign. So this couldn't be right for uh, reasons because this is not how logical indexing works. This would say origin is now LJA not, you know, which origins are equal to take the value LGA. So it can't be that.
no one else cares to venture? Okay, the correct answer is the one that I think is sort of the simplest right. It's filter. Because you want to filter flights, and you want the origin to be LaGuardia and the destination to be IHS. So the, the simple syntax works. As I said, it isn't for. This doesn't make sense. Filter flights to origin is going to give you a data frame of all the flights who start out at LaGuardia. And similarly, filter flights destination equals IAH is going to give you all the uh, flights that landed in, uh, uh, in George Bush in Houston. But the logical and doesn't work for um, data frames. You, you, you don't talk about, you, you can talk about intersect, but um, you can't talk about and. Now, the intersect won't work either, uh, even if it was written differently, because if these two, the intersection of these two uh, data frames is going to be zero because they're just different. You know, intersect just says are the two. Ob it's going to look at the two objects, and the two objects are different. So the correct answer is a symbol saying, "I want to filter. I want to just take all the rows of flights who started at LGA and wound up at IHS, IAH." Okay, I think I skipped one. So, um, as I said. When you actually looked at the data, it, it's clear. I, I, I could do the same thing I did before, but let's not. Um, let's move on to something I was actually asked about the other day, which is t-test. So one way you might want to do this is you could say, well, is there a statistical difference between being uh, in the mean value being minus 4 and the mean value being 15, or the mean value being 15 and the mean value being 4? And you can ask if, if there's a statistical difference between those mean values. And as we discussed a little bit last week, uh, there is a way to do that. It's called a t-test. And you, it's specifically to samples. So the t-test is typically, uh, I actually don't know of any of the use except to determine if two means are the same or not. So um, important point, a t-test doesn't prove anything. But it provides evidence for or against the null hypothesis. And for the t-test, the null hypothesis is that the two means are the same. Now, sometimes you see t-tests on one piece of data. What you're asking there is then the second data is sort of, it was implicitly just all zeros. So you're really asking if you do a t-test on one piece of data, is the mean of that data set statistically likely to be zero? But for two data sets, you're asking if the means are the same. Um, so it's a hypothesis. And there's a hypothesis that the underlying data forms a normal distribution. In other words, you've sampled from normal distributions. And it computes a t-score, which is a z-score, for a sample. Um, when you're doing t-tests, one very, very important point is it does have this hypothesis that the samples are drawn from a normal distribution. You need to take care that your data looks approximately normal. If it doesn't, you're going to get results that are too optimistic. In other words, the real values are going to be much larger. So you need to pay some attention to if your data is normally distributed. And incidentally, uh, this is a subject for more advanced class, but there are various tests for doing this, and which perhaps the most famous or important one is something called the Komogorov-Smirnov test. And it's a test uh, you can read about uh, if you have to use it that'll tell you if it, more generally, it'll tell you if two samples are drawn from this, likely to be drawn from the same distribution, but you can ask if, the, if a sample is drawn from a normal distribution. Okay, so the t.test function does this for us, and there's various things. You can say, well, what if the sample sizes are different? What if they have different variants? And um, this t.test takes a look at your data and does the right test, you know, the most general test that is needed, and the test statistic is the mean of the first minus the mean of the second divided by oops standard error, which is computed as there. So you, you take the sample uh, variance divided by the sample size for the first one, and then the sample size for the second one divided by the sample variance for the second variable divided by the sample size. So you can see it depends on the variance of your samples and the sample size. And so getting back to the question I was asked earlier, this is a good example how sample size comes into things. Uh, now, what do I mean by that? <clears throat> Suppose sample size is really large. Th 
this means these, this number, you know, so it's going to be something divided by something really large or something really small. So the samples are both really large size. This number, let me just show his math just for fun. Uh, anyway, this number is going to be very small. Now you're going to divide by this number. So when you divide by something very small, you get something that's large. If, for example, this it's 0 0.001, when you divide it by it, it's by multiplying by 1,000. So what does this mean? It means as the sample size gets large, this number gets small, and the difference in means gets multiplied by larger numbers. Right? Conclusion, as the sample size gets large, the T statistic for a given value becomes much, much larger. And what this means is what this means is that very small differences in the mean can be statistically significant if the sample size is larger enough. So, for example, I get 0 0.001 means multiply by a thousand. So, I have a difference between my two means of 0.5. You say, well, that's not very big. It's a very small difference. But if the, if this um, denominator was you know 0 0.001 you'd multiply by by a thousand and now you have 500 which is an insanely large t-score so this is an example of the same phenomena where the raw numbers are going to tell you something very different than percentages because the raw numbers are going to con include um, sample size all right before I go on are, are there any questions I will wait long enough for me to have a sip of coffee I like make it three. Okay, so we're going to do the t test, but you know, and how am I going to do that? And so I'm going to filter flights by time of day, and then select the one column, which is just arrival day. So I'm going to flight that early. So I'm going to filter flights by time of day equals early, and then I'm going to further say flight that early is I'm just going to select from flight early the column arrival delay. So this is going to give me um, a data frame which is going to have the flights which are marked early and their arrival delay, similarly for midday and evening. So I'm going to create three data frames which have, well, one redundant column. It's going to either be all early or all midday or all evening, and then the average delay. Uh, and then I'm going to just calculate the means, and we see they come out as before. So to apply the t-test, I just, you know, um, okay, so I did this using these filter commands, which were in the deep plier package, which is part of the tidyverse. Uh, it automatically does the um, courtesy for you of turning your ordinary data frame into a tibble, which has various, it looks like a data frame, it'll, anything a data frame does, it'll do, but it isn't a data frame under the hood. The t-test wants data frames. And my comment is I'm not the only one who dislikes tibbles, but of course, the t-test was invented prior to the existence of that, but in any event, to make it work, you have to make your things data frames. So I use the as dot data dot frame to then perform the t-test, and it automatically knows I'm looking at the mean of these two things, minus 4.3 and 4.0, and saying, are they statistically, is it likely to be that they were drawn from the same set? And you see the Welsh two-sample t-test is the most general one. That's the one that says, I know you have... Uh, two data sets of unequal size and, une and unequal variance. But nonetheless, it computes the t value and it says the probability that these are drawn from the same distribution is essentially zero. So the alternative hypothesis, the true mean difference in means, is not equal to zero. So in um, statistics, blah, 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 with a p value of, uh, by the way, 2.2 to the minus 16 is the smallest number that R officially recognizes. So with a t value of essentially zero, we are going to reject the hypothesis that these two samples come from the same, uh, would run from a data set with the same mean, and accept the alternative hypothesis that the means are different. So I'm, I just did a simple two-sided test, but we conclude that, in fact, there is a statistical difference uh, between the two observed means, and that, therefore, leaving earlier in the day is really better than leaving the midday, which of course is going to also be better than leaving later in the day. So if you can stand the lack of sleep, leave earlier in the day. Okay. 
now the quiz, what is MN, what is this function MN and why do I use it? Uh, over here you see I used MN and flight to get these values which were, um, I, I guess I didn't do it anywhere else. But So what is MN and why did I use it? I'll give you a hint, MN is short for mean. No one? All right. I'll remind you. There we go. MN was a function I wrote that took the mean and removed the, the NAs. So it meant I didn't have to write, I could have wrote mean of whatever I wanted, NA dot RM equals true, but this MN just is an abbreviation for that. Now we were at slide uh, 38, I believe. So let's go back there. So I used MN because there were NAs, and it just computes the mean with NAs. Okay, so. According to the t-test, there is no difference. We got a p-value of essentially zero, so um, it it's, makes no difference. So um, if if it didn't work from um, afternoon versus um, morning, it's certainly for evening, which is the perceived difference is larger. You're also going to say the same thing. So according to t-test, there's no difference between the two means. Another quiz. On the last slide, I said something that was egregiously wrong. Okay, I see. I'm, I'm getting uh, questions and information from uh, uh, it's late, so I'm, I'm, I apologize. I'll just wait more time uh, for this one. Uh, so let me go back here, previous page. I said something on this page. One of these three statements is egregiously wrong based on this information, uh, you know, uh, what the t-test said, and which statement is it. Um, so in the t-test, I'm asked, why did we divide by the sum of the variance of the two samples? Is there any derivation of this formula I can look at offline? So I, I, I didn't want to derive this formula. It's a math formula, but of course, I mean, I. You know, if, if you look at, I, I, you know, I, let me go and get a, a reference and I'll pulse it out to Manish and he can forward it on to anyone who wants. Um, but there is a derivation, of course. Um, the, the idea is, you know, if you, if you want to compare two means, assume for a second that, you know, the variance has the same. You know, that, then you're computing just an ordinary um, T value which you have to divide by the standard error because after all just computing a statistic you know just computing a you know a scaled value doesn't tell you anything about sample size you, you have to account for the sample size and um, the, the Welsh you know denominator you know accounts for the sample size it allows the two sample sizes to be different so remember if you look at the standard when, when we very early on we talked about standard error and standard error is the standard deviation divided by the sample size it's sort of on average how much you ex you know you, you expect to be off and so uh, the short answer is you divide by it because that's the way you get you, you want to divide by the standard error not the um, estimated standard deviation and the Welsh um, <clears throat> modification is what you do when the two sample sizes are different and, and in addition to having different variants Okay, let's see if I have any. Can I show us the last slide again? Yeah. So according to the t-test, there is no difference is one of the things. What about the evening compared to the morning? And there is a perceived difference of over 20 minutes in the uh, evening compared to the morning. And I have statement one seems to be wrong. Statement one is wrong. 
Statement one is that the t-test is no difference. According to the t-test, there was a difference. What did the t-test do? It compared the two means and said, oh, the, the hypothesis is that they were the, they were drawn from two population from a population which had the same mean. Both were drawn from that, and I got a p-value of zero, saying the probability of them being drawn from populations with the same mean is essentially zero. So the alternative hypothesis that the true difference in means is not equal to zero is what is accepted because the probability of the hypothesis being true is basically zero. So according to the t-test there is a difference because the p-value is zero. Alright, um, and here I just did the um, early versus evening which is a much bigger one and you, you, you know it has to also have um, a p-value of zero because if the smaller one didn't was statistically significant then the larger one has to be two. All right um, let's see if we can build a model to predict arrival delay. Um, spoiler alert it's not going to work well. We'll talk more about what doesn't work well and why later. So we have all these columns and, and you know obviously some of them are not relevant. Uh, year is definitely not relevant, it's the same. It's hard to understand how day is. It's conceivable month is, you know, probably in the winter there's more delays than there are in the summer, but uh, let's not worry about that. Let's, let's just eliminate. So I, I eliminated tail number. It's conceivable that the plane, you know, there are certain planes that just aren't very good, but the interest of simplicity, I didn't want to look at it. I don't want to look at the year, and I didn't look at 16 through 20, which are all these um, information I create, you know, that they has about the, you know, hour. So we're going to use the month. Winter might have more delays. It's a categorical variable. The carrier is categorical. Now, how many values does month take? It takes 12, so it'll create 11 variables. I don't remember the exact number of carriers. The origin. We, we know for a fact it's going to depend on which airport you start out from, the distance, the time of day, and where it's going to. Let's see what happens. Um, oh, and also the arrival delay is going to be the thing, and where are they going to? So let's top right in. Let's create a model. I'm going to first select the, the, the columns I want, and then I'm going to do a model. I'm going to take a little model. I want to predict arrival delay based on this flights, which is the, the this FLTS2 is flights with just these variables I cared about. Well, it starts looking good. Um, a lot of significant variables. Uh, carrier OO is insignificant. Uh, carrier VX is insignificant. Probably as a function of the fact that they don't have a lot of flights. Uh, what can we say about the residuals? On average, we're off by 10 minutes, but sometimes we're really off. Um, there was a huge number of variables because I put in one different one for each destination. Uh, residual standard error is 43. So on average, you know, there's a pretty big var That's saying there's a pretty big difference in how much the errors vary. We can see that because the median and um. On, you know, half the errors were less than 10 minutes uh, off, half them were bigger than 10, but the largest one was this 1276, and this is reflected in an R squared of 0.04. Remember, R squared ranges between 0 and 1. So from an R squared point of view, this is not very good. Why? Well, probably there's too many variables. When you have that many variables, you know, you might be just confounding. They, they could be highly correlated, and therefore, you know, the model you're going to is going to be very confused. So one thing to do is you might ask, does the airline matter? So I'm going to look, flights by airline, is I'm going to group the airlines, the flights data set by the carrier. That means I'm going to get one row for each carrier. And what information do I want to have? I want to have by airline, by carrier, how many flights it flew, and how many late flights it had. And then I want to arrange it by 
the number of flights. So the airlines that follow the most flights, I'm going to have those on top. And finally, I'm just, you know, so because I, I can visualize uh, things, I want to have that. I'm asked a question. What does residual value mean? Well, when you do a linear regression, right, you have two pieces of information, the actual value and your predicted value. The difference between the two is the residual. So it's, if you will, the error in your um, estimate for the value. So we're, we're computing, uh, you know, how late it's going to be. So the difference between how late we compute it to be and what it, how late the flight actually is, is the residual error. So um, now I want to see is, is, does the carrier seem to really be important? And you, you can see I now have them. United Airlines turns out to be the largest carrier in the New York area, just slightly bigger than B6, whatever that is. I don't know what B6 is. Um, but you can see how many flights, and you can see how many late flights, and you can see the percentages. So they're pretty much over the place. And, and FL, it's a small sample size, but oops. It sure looks like you don't want to be on FL. UA seems to be in the big end. Uh, EV and B6 seem to have much higher. So it looks like maybe carrier doesn't matter. Uh, so we're going to do a chi-square test. I mean, if you look at this data, we can really just sort of ask if these um, number of white flights for the total number of flights per carrier, if it's likely these are independent of the carrier. You know, just if you sampled, you were going to, it's reasonable to get numbers and all these things, or are there differences? So for that, we're going to use a chi-square test because we have counts. We have counts of flights and counts of late flights. So um, B6 is jet blue. Ha! A lot of flights and uh, not so good on time. That, that's about what I've heard about jet blue. If you had customer satisfaction, I think they, 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 you'd go way, way down for B6. Okay, so chi-squared. So what's the null hypothesis for the chi-squared? Uh, that there's no difference in the distributions or that there is a difference in the distributions? Remember, uh, we did uh, chi-squared. The big one we did was we wanted to see if cancer rates varied, you know, on for smokers and non-smokers based on how many cigarettes uh, they had. So you had people getting cancer and not getting cancer, and they had, you know, low cigarette, you know, they had like no cigarettes, smoked a few cigarettes, smoked more, smoked a fair amount, and smoked a lot of cigarettes. And the question was, did you see, did it look like the smokers and non-smokers? So does anyone remember? Okay, so I, I have um, a bunch of people coming in with one that is correct. The, the null hypothesis is that the two distributions are the same. So if I apply that to this data set, my null hypothesis is going to be that these number of late flights is independent of the carrier. And so I did it. I do late flights, number of flights. So this, this is it, late flights on time flights. I do the chi-squared cast. And we get um, the p-value is very, very small. So we reject the null. The probability that the null so we have the p-value is essentially zero, so we reject the null hypothesis that they're the same. So it does seem that we're going to have to include airlines. And um, just for fun, I, I just thought, well, let's take a look how many flights they fly per airline. Here we see uh, United. As someone kindly pointed out, we have um, B6. is also very high. And EV. So you can see that there's a large difference in the number of flights. And, and, and you can use ggplot, uh, it, it's kind of nice to, to see this. It, it makes it, it just pops out to you with your lines. You want to say, well, what's a small one? Well, these two are small, these three, and you can see these are these over here. All right, but it does make one suggestion that there's a bunch of small carriers, we should pop them all together. Um, we know what they are because uh, we did this flight by airline, which uh, showed us Uh, which, how many flights they were, you know, so for example, OO had 32 flights, it's not going to do it, so we can group them together. Uh, we should also check for destination delay, but that's not at the moment. So, I just, well, not quite arbitrarily, I put the, bo the bottom uh, eight, okay? 
why do I say not so arbitrarily? Because number nine is you're down from 12,000 from 18,000. So basically eight and above are 20,000 and more and nine and below is, is significant. There's a significant jump from 18,000 to 12,000. So I, I, I arbitrarily said this will work. This will give me a miscellaneous airline with about 20,000 flights. So how do I do this? I say which flight carriers, which, which are the carriers in flight whose name is in the names of flight carrier by airline of 9 through 16. And then I say for those flights, okay, so where the carrier is one of these lesser ones, I'm just going to change it to miscellaneous. So what this code does, what these two lanes does is first it pulls out all the flight carriers that are in whose name is one of the bottom uh, eight names and then I rename them miscellaneous and I can check this if I go to unique which tells me all the unique values that flight carrier takes it gives me the ones I know and now I have miscellaneous instead of that so this little code replaces all those bottom um, eight carrier names with the name miscellaneous and pops them all together so now if I group by carrier excuse me I'm going to get nine distinct uh, rows, one for each of these airlines, and the ninth row will be miscellaneous. Um, so let's take a brief look at delay by airport. So I'm going to group by flights by destination. Destination is where they went to, and I want to summarize the flights by arrival delay and the distance. Okay? So I want to take a look for each destination, how much on average they were late, and how far they were for were the flights. And then I, I see I arrange them descending from distance, which means the flights that, that were the longest, the airport that was the longest distance, that's going to be on top, and the airports that were the shortest distance flights were going to be on the bottom. And you can see, if I look at the head, the big winner is HNL, which is Honolulu. I'm going to assume ANC is Anchorage, SFL, San Francisco. So not surprisingly, the longest distance flights, and these are the average distances, were the flights on the west coast in Hawaii. And if you look at tails, you can see, and, and I don't know how LaGuardia, I mean, I guess there are some flights that go from JFK to LaGuardia. And they're just, you know, but you can see Philadelphia, I don't know what that is. ALB is Albany, is in upstate New York. God, it's just embarrassing. I don't know, PVD, maybe Philadelphia. Anyway, you can see, but more interestingly, if you look, now, SMF has a huge delay. It's a pretty far away airport. But Honolulu, Anchorage, they arrive on time. Well, essentially everyone except SMF, despite the distance, arrive on time. And similarly, you can see some of these short flights, PVD, Albany, they tend to be late. So there's the correlation between or the relationship between how late a flight is and how long the flight is is well perhaps more complicated than it would seem at first so per se distance is not relevant now of course if, if you follow up my, my argument would be longer flights are less likely to be late because they have more time in flight to make it up if you're a half hour late and you have seven hours in the air it's no problem to make it up if you're a half hour late and you are an hour in the air you're just going to be late Okay, so um, there are also some NAs. So the first thing I want to do is I want to, to, to do, get rid of this issue going forward is I want to get rid of them. So here's another thing. Remember, complete.cases, it gives you an index of all the rows for which there's no NAs. So if I take flights, well, complete.cases of flights will give me all the rows for which is no NAs. So if I index, so if I just use the rows of flights, which are all the complete rows, I'm going to get rid of all the NAs. Now, you can, you can check this. Have I eliminated a lot of data? Some complete dot cases, you can see it's going to be 327,000, whereas the original flight is 336. So I've only eliminated about 9,000 flights by this. So this is pretty reasonable in terms of an analysis. So, and um, just note what I did was I uh, called it flight.plot because now that there's no NAs, I can plot it. And here, I uh, did a flight dot plot. Um, 
and it, the set X is how the distance, and the Y value is the arrival delay, and I just get the I just drew the LM line. You can see that very short distances there's a lot of noise because there aren't many of them, but you can see that overall as the distance increases, the average delay does. So there is some relationship. It's the opposite of what maybe you'd expect at first. The longer the flight, the less the delay. Now the other thing I did is I said, well, does it depend on carrier? And, and this is something where ggplot truly shines. All I have to do is take this previous code, ggplot, and I want to, here's my data, flight.plot, and the aesthetic tells you the x and the y, and all I do is I add fill as carrier, and now what it's going to do is, for every carrier, draw a separate line. So this is like all the different carriers, the line of how they do. So incidentally, the one thing it shows is um, <laughs> the miscellaneous do the best. So some, some of those airlines must be very good on long flights. Uh, this purple one is United. It also shows it. Uh, the only one where it's where it sort of very significantly falls is this light blue one, uh, which used to be MQ. But notice they only fly short flights. So and remember, if you looked at uh, the chart, you can see sort of when the flights are really short, the gray area is sort of how confident you are. So when you have short flights, it, it, it kind of makes sense that, you know, if you're flying five feet, it doesn't make any difference. You know, you could just go a little faster. But for the short flights, it, it's a little different. But this, this, this graph gives you some very good information. And all you had to do was add this one extra line, fill equals carrier, and it turned it from a plot of everything to different plots per carrier. I think that's a really, really good thing. So we can, uh, all I did then is um, I um, said the top carriers are just the ones that were in one through six. So this is the carrier names of flight by carrier. Remember it was ordered so that it went from the most, um, the, the, the top airlines in terms of number of flights. And so a flight that plot two is I filter flight that plot. I want the, the carrier to be in these names of the top carriers. And you can see we get United, American, uh, EasyJet, and that's that. And we can redo it. And again, we see that just these two, uh, MQ and uh, EasyJet, are the only uh, two that violate the, oh, excuse me, it's a pink one. American Airlines has some issues. But certainly the ones, uh, United, the ones that fly the longest flights, they have less issues. Okay, so, and I just redid the graph with red so you can see more clearly. And, and so these bands are sort of like, sort of telling you, they're confidence intervals, so they're telling you, um, they're telling you how likely, you know, how confident you are, you know, so it's saying that while there's a steady decrease as you go further and further distance, there's a little more variability in how exactly, you know, distance and flight delay is very, is connected. Okay, so let's just do one final model. Let's just use distance because it seems like this is a pretty powerful indicator. And let's use time of day because we know time of day is important. We saw that. So model 2 dot delay is I'm going to, uh, I want to create a linear model to predict arrival delay based on distance plus time of day and my data is flights. And so I make this linear model and I create the summary. This just tells me the formula. And uh, we have the, we just notice we're going to have the same problem. The median minus 10 for the residuals, that, that, that's fine per se. The problem is we see this maximum value. And uh, what does it say? It says the intercept, which is uh, not too big, is not significant, but the distance, and basically, you know, remember, time of day had three values, early, midday, and evening. So you create two categorical values, because categorical values take the values 0 and 1. So if it's 0 for evening and 0 for midday, then it's by, you know, logical deduction, it's 1 for um, morning. So you only need two of them. And all three of these are significant. So it does say, and, and by the way, you do get a negative coefficient. That's a good sign. You expect that the delay to be smaller as, um, 
you travel further. We saw that. So th th this makes sense. Um, I don't know why this is on, on two pages, but then I just did the um, same thing with the complete cases, and uh, it doesn't make any significant difference. Uh, but per se, you're getting something okay, but again, no CR squared is incredibly small. So what they're saying is most of the variance you're seeing is not described by this model, which actually makes sense because what you're seeing is, is most of the delays aren't that bad, but you got a few delays that are huge. Now, how do you get delays? There's sort of two things that can happen. It's sort of the normal delays, this plane got in 15 minutes late, this stewardess was five minutes late, the crew took a little longer, and delays accumulate. Because if, you're, if your plane is flying uh, out of New York first thing in the morning, it's there to go in the first thing in the morning. If it's coming in from Boston, it could have been a few minutes late getting from Boston. Then because of that, the crews don't get on quite the, in the same time that they're supposed to, and they're late. Now because you didn't leave on time when you're supposed to, you're delayed and for your actual departure. So delays accumulate. But, you know, those delays are the, the annoying standard ones. This is um, 1,200, this is 20 hours late. This is not the plane was a half hour late. This is one of two things. This is either the plane got there and they noticed it was a major mechanical error, and that they just had to get a new plane and they didn't have one, or it was a snowstorm. This is, you know, a real, real serious issue. This is, you know, like, guys, you know, New York is clear and fine, but we're heading to um, Houston, and Houston, they're having a tornado, and we ain't leaving till the tornado warnings are over, and that's going to be, you know, eight hours from now. So these, these things, this linear model isn't going to be good. Specifically, we have these you know, we, we could sort of delay, and you'd have to do more analysis to make, you know, if you wanted to satisfy the boss about it, but you, you'd, you'd want to divide delays into two kinds, sort of ordinary delays. Well, you know, on any given Tuesday, the plane could be 20 minutes late, and uh, on uh, June 11th, the plane broke down, and the flight was canceled, and they didn't have any more equipment, and therefore that. Or, you know, maybe you, you would, do, at this point, we use the tail noom and see if there were certain planes that just were bad planes. So that would be hard data to use, because generally, when you uh, book a ticket, they won't tell you what flight, what plane you're going to be on, what specific plane. But so you might want to distinguish those two things. So and and, and you can see this. You can see on average the average delay was seven minutes. The third quartile of delays was 14, and the largest was 11:27 among the final, among this flight stuff final where I illuminated the rows with NAs. So there's a few delays that are really large. And we can see this with a look at the histogram. Why is it yellow? I just wanted to make it yellow to see if it was fun. It isn't. But anyway, you can see, you know, there's a lot of really short delays, some negative delays. Actually, there's it seems more ways to come and um, arrive early than uh, arrive late. But, you know, can't count on that. So there's a few planes with really large delays that are massing things. And how do you deal with that? So, well, one thing you can do is you can just sort of, sort of arbitrarily say, which I did, and I picked 200 out of a hat or out of thin air. As I said, well, two hours, that's three hours and a bit. Anything more than that, I'm just going to say is some sort of act of God situation. You know, it's one of those random things. You get to the airport and they just say, sorry, today's not your lucky day. Your airplane had a major flaw and we have to wait for new equipment. Or, sorry. You're flying to a city that has major delays. They're not letting us fly in because of weather, you know, in San Francisco. You know, they're not letting us fly in because of weather. And well, it never happens in Honolulu, by the way. <laughs> they're not letting you fly in because of weather in Anchorage. There's a big snowstorm there, and we're not leaving until they say it's going to be okay. And you can see, so I, I'm going to eliminate those that have um, delays of more than 200 minutes, and I call that flight stop final two. And you can see it's over 90, so less than 1% of these flights have these big delays. So that, that's reasonable. You can just sort of say this is some sort of act of God. And let's redo it with this. So now I'm going to create the model arrival today, delay. I'm going to model it on distance and time of day. But now I'm going to 
use this data set, which is all the um, flights that were, didn't have these catastrophic delays. Does it work? Well, <laughs> the one thing that happens uh, is that you get much more uh, largest residuals. Um, again, the intercept is not significant, and all the other coefficients are. Uh, standard error becomes much more. Uh, it says all these coefficients, but, but the R squared uh, still stays poor. And, and the reason why I think is clear. Again, what you see from this is that, um, or rather what you would see from this, is that almost all the flights have very little delay. So, for example, if you just sort of said, it's going to be within 10 minutes of on time, you're going to capture most of this. But if you're trying to get an actual model, it's very hard to predict the days. So I'm asked why is the actual residual greater than 200? Uh, because that's because the estimate. Uh, it, it's reasonable that the um, while you said the maximum delay is 200, you can get a residual bigger. Just imagine that for the flight that is 200 minutes late, they predicted it was uh, going to be seven minutes early because it was something very special about that. So the residual can be bigger than the maximum actual value because you could have sign differences. All right. Good catch. I'm, you know, that's very nice that you uh, noticed that. I mean, so you're saying the max delay, the max residual is bigger than the max delay. And that, what that says is somehow for the flight that was um, <clears throat> 200 minutes late, it predicted it would actually be 7.59 minutes early which shows you these very long delays are very hard to figure out. So, and that's going to add hugely to the average value of the residuals. Okay, but it's not a good model because of, so basically what's happening is the linear model is not good and because there are just some delays that the linear model isn't able to figure out. So why it's better, but it's still not good. I mean, you know, from a, numeric point of view, and will this ever work? I, I don't think it will. By the way, we're almost at the end here. Um, and why not? Because the linear model does one thing. It assumes all the model relationships are linear, okay? It doesn't take into account maybe there's some sort of logarithmic differences or interactions. Now, in more sophisticated modeling, we could look into that, but I think the real thing is just the linear model is not the right kind of model. You need something in a in the family of uh, you know a tree model where you could look into an account like where you could say if the weather if the month is December and you're flying to Anchorage that's a different category than if the you know month is June when, when the weather's nice everywhere um, so you, you have nonlinearities you might have to look at logs you might have to look at you know interaction terms and you need to distinguish special cases and, and a linear model is not going to be good on that and as I wrote, for example, delays may depend on destination airport and time of year. Uh, but this, so what can you say? This is, I think, you know, I've shown you a lot of information on how to analyze this, but in the end, this would not be a good thing to do with a linear model if you really want to predict accurately. On the other hand, what you could probably, from this analysis, what's clear, you could, you could certainly say for most airports, most of the time, your analysis is going to be fine. It, it's like I had a friend who was working for a, a company and they asked him to produce a model about which of their stars were likely to be robbed. <clears throat> and he produced a model and it was 83% accurate and they were delighted with him. What he didn't point out to them because he wished to keep his job was if you just said no stars are going to be robbed, he would have been 95% accurate because being robbed is a very unusual event. So. It really was, you know, it was a generalized linear model. It was a logit model, but basically the uh, point was is that these kind of models that they wanted were not appropriate. And so, similarly, I think the real answer is, <coughs> if you wanted to figure out what are these small percentages of flights that are going to be vastly delayed, a linear model is just not a good thing to do. It. But I think you've learned a lot, and you've seen why it doesn't work from the analysis we did with the various deep wire and plotting tools we use. So. All right, so this is actually the last slide uh, for the class period. And so my three final points is I've, I've actually really enjoyed doing this. It's been fun and it's been, you know, it's been a learning experience for me. Um, 
I sincerely hope you've enjoyed it, and I sincerely hope that there will be future classes in which I will see you. Um, I'm going to talk to Manish. Uh, the one thing I could would ask is um, I would really appreciate if I could get some uh, frank feedback. While we all like to hear how wonderful we are and how superb everything we've ever done in life is, it, it, surprisingly it turns out to be more useful to hear about our failings and how we can improve things. So if there were, you know, even if you were, you know, please feel free to tell me that you enjoyed the class, if you enjoyed the class, but if you had some points at which you felt things could be done better or things could be done differently, or there were, you know, things in my style, anything that, you know, you felt would have made the class better, I would really appreciate hearing it. And with that, I wish you all a good day, good luck, and as I said, I hopefully we will see you in some future. Yes. All right. Thanks. Thanks a lot, sir. As I said, it was my pleasure. I, I really sincerely hope you enjoyed this. As I said, thank you for being a audience. All right, I'm going to uh, call it a day. All right, I will. Um, I will get out in the next day or two the final project, and it'll be up to Manish and I will decide how long you'll have to do it. It, it. It's going to be similar to the midterm. I'm going to build on the midterm. I think that's a good. Um, that'll be a good uh, way to do it. But I, I want to spend some time actually thinking about it, and of course. What I will do is, <laughs> before I send out to you the, 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 the final, I will have an answer key of sorts because that will make sure that there's nothing I missed. All right. Have a great day, everyone.